Our speaker tonight is Steve Edelson. He's a sports columnist for the Asbury Park Press. He has over 30 years of experience writing. He's covered professional and local sports, he covered the New York Giants at one time, covered the New York Jets at one time. That was a full-time job from, Ju from July all the way, every weekend, home or away. He was well, the soft job away at, at football games. He's covered golf, he's been at the Masters, the British Open, and many other sports events. He's a fantastic columnist, and he also is my son, so. <laughs> so here's Steve Edelson. Thank you for that intro. Why don't you take your notes there? Thanks. Well, we're finally going. Thanks for coming. And I'm glad to be here. I hope everyone can hear me good. Um, it's been a while since I've been in here. It was a gym at one point. I remember playing dodgeball in here. And, uh, a lot of history in this school. And, you know, we're going to talk about old photos tonight. And I, I've I've always had a thing about old photos. You know, if, if you show me like a photo from like the Civil War of just, you know, troops sitting around, you see the faces, and I want to know more about them. You know, what, did they survive the war? What did they do after the war? Everything about that. Was, I've always been drawn to historic photos. And when you look at, at old photos, I, I dare say that most of them are worth way more than a thousand words. This is an example of what I'm talking about right here. It's been up there for a while. These are the four horsemen of Leonardo. That photo was taken in 1925. That's right, Leonardo High School. So a year earlier, Graylin Rice, the famous sports writer, had dubbed New Rockney's backfield at Notre Dame the four horsemen. Now, Leonardo High School, which would become Middletown High School, now Middletown North, had a great football team, best football team in the state, one of them, in the mid-1920s. So they seized upon that, and they named the backfield the Four Horsemen, and those are them. Now, that in itself is kind of neat, but there's one person in here who is very significant, and that's this guy, and his name is Tucker Hansen. And everyone called him Swede. And Swede Hansen was the first superstar athlete at the Jersey Shore. He led two teams to state championships, unbeaten in baseball. He was all state, three sports. In 1925, this team was unbeaten. And in those days, there was a team from Rahway, they called them the Wonder Team, had been unbeaten for four years. And they challenged Leonardo to a game. They played at Rutgers. And Rahway won. And that was the only loss these guys suffered that year, 1925. A year later, they came back. They were unbeaten again. And they played Rahway again. They beat him by 40 points. Oh. And that was Sweet Hansen's last game. He, he had these legendary accomplishments. And they went to Temple. And again, Bunyan-esque figure, everything he did. He was in the Ripley's, believe it or not, for having punted a ball out of Temple Stadium. So he was this larger than life figure. Gareth, you can turn it. He went on to play on the very first Philadelphia Eagles team. That's Sweet Hansen right there. Scored the first ever touchdown for the Philadelphia Eagles. And had a great career in the NFL. And again, you look at these photos, and it kind of transports you back to that time. And you know, I, I just have always loved going through them and, and looking at them. About five years ago, I started trying to come up with a concept of how to incorporate history into a series of stories. And what we came up with eventually became our first series, which was Greatest high school basketball players ever at the Jersey Shore. And we ran it, and it was the most popular thing we had ever seen. In, in the age of metrics where you could tell how many people clicked on a story, how long they were on there, it was unparalleled. So we had clearly tapped into something that people really enjoyed. 
And so we've been doing it ever since. And they all been, one has been more popular than the next. Um, and I, I think what they do is they, they really they capture the essence of the period and they kind of weave this history of not only sports in Monmouth and Ocean Counties, but of life. Uh, and you, you see the photos and you see the people and the photos are what make the stories work. You know, they put a face on that. They transport you back to that time. And that has really been uh, the key to it all. For me, what it's meant is digging through a lot of our old photos in our archives and coming across these incredible images, some of which I just stumbled upon and um, have no idea, but you want to know the stories behind them. And that has kind of been what has driven me on some of these. And a lot of them have kind of a personal nature to them that I find them. So the next one here, so this was taken in the Ocean Township gym in March, February of 1971. That happened to be the first game my dad ever took me to. Because, and I remember it distinctly, the gym was packed and Ocean was playing a state tournament game, the greatest Ocean team ever, and they won by about 40 points. And that's Mark Lackey right there. I remember the night distinctly, and it was also the first night I ever saw Tommy Graham when he walked into the gym, and I'm good friends with him to this day. So, again, a look back at the greatest Ocean Township team. It's just a great photograph, and the guy with his back to me right here is our neighboring colonial terrorist, Charlie Brown, <laughs> who I'm walking the dog the day after this story ran, and he comes up to me and said, my wife Patty looked at the photo and the first thing she said was, that's the back of your head. I know. <laughs> so, again, in these photos, they, they really, uh, they take on kind of a personal meaning when you see something like this. Here's another one. I love, I love photos that just show emotion. And this, when I saw this photo, it, it was great. This is uh, not that old. 1998, that's Long Branch, that's Fred Sprangle. They have just beaten Red Bank. And it, it just, you see the emotion in that. Fred went on to coach a couple places and I, I've become pretty good friends with him. And you just see everything about this photo is great. And this guy here, look at him, covered in mud after that game. Now, it turns out his name is Tariq Morrison. And he's another one of our neighbors in Colonial Terrace, and he's a middle school teacher in Long Branch to this day, and he's a great guy. But again, another photo, I, I just, I love the emotion of it. Okay, Gary. Another photo I came across. So this is Convention Hall in the mid-1960s for high school basketball game. Now, again, you can see it is packed. That's the entryway there. There's not, a, it, this is all standing room along here. This is a short conference semifinal. And I believe it's Lakewood. I forget who else who they're playing. But you can, I mean, you can see it's packed right along the court. Uh, when you see photos like this, I mean, it's almost like you're at the game. And having been in there so many times, you see what a great place that was and still could be, really, uh, to this day. Yeah. Here's another good old photo. And I'm just taking you through some of my favorites right now, and then we're going to get into in-depth on a few other items. This is Mama Park. And that's Amory Haskell. Right there in the, in the 1950s, you see the old ambulances and uh, things, and you see how packed it is. I mean, it is really crowded. Just standing there addressing the crowd, and you know, again, uh, just an old time, having spent a lot of time at Monmouth Park over the last few years uh, writing stuff, it really takes you back to that time and that era uh, when, you know, that was the entertainment. You know, there was no ESPN, there was no 
uh, no television all, all the time. So that's what you did. Okay. I love everything about this photo right here. This is from 1983. So this is Pat Tolan. And you see, this is after he literally had single-handedly carried Middletown North to a state championship. Standing after the game, holding his dad's hand, you know, ripped jersey, you know, just looking completely exhausted on the field after the game. Uh, team went unbeaten that year. Pat was an absolute star of that team. And... You know, you just see it in their faces how, you know, first of all, how tired he is, but just how, uh, what a great moment that is for that family. So I love that photo. And he, Pat Tolan, who went on to play at Syracuse, uh, was a great track and field guy. Um, shot put, discus, javelin, and to this day competes in master's divisions. One of the best in the country, still lives in the area. They don't. I would argue that this is the most iconic image we have at the Asbury Park Press for a number of reasons. So this is taken in 1974 in Convention Hall in Atlantic City. And that is Warren Wolf on his players' shoulders after they won the first ever state championship in New Jersey. The first year they had them. So Warren Wolf at Brick, not only was he the mayor, he was the greatest coach ever in New Jersey wins-wise. For 35 years, that was the epicenter of high school football, in, New, in certainly at the Jersey Shore and probably in the state. And you just see the emotion after this game. Um, Warren Wolf you know, is still a legend. And that game was maybe the most important game ever at the Jersey Shore, uh, having won the first state championship. You see the players. This right here, this, is, this guy's name is Mark Heil. He was a linebacker on Brick. Went on to become a, a, a great high school coach in North Carolina, where he lives now. Um, and funny story, uh, this is the, the 74 season, 73 season, Brick's only loss was to Montclair, but a really good team. Mark Heil at Brick, they were losing the game, they were going to lose the game, but he intercepted a pass, he was running back for a touchdown, and one of the Montclair coaches came off the sideline and tackled him. That's <laughs> <laughs> Mark Heil. <laughs> you know, he's told me that story personally. <laughs> so, but again, just an, an amazing snapshot of history of, of, of sports at the Jersey Shore. It's another one I, I just threw in there because this was taken by one of our photographers. This is in the 1980s and that's Warren Wolf again. You know, like an hour before the game, just by himself, walking and thinking. And I just love the, the, the way it's framed. Um, him in focus, everything else not in focus. And, uh, you know, that's the way he was. He wore that coat, and he, um, you know, he, he, was, he left nothing to chance. And you can see right here that he is, he is focused on, on that game and everything that's going to happen over the next few hours. So, all right, Karen. I love team, I love team photos. <clears throat> I really do. I, I think that uh, they say so much, and you can derive so many stories from them. And this one, we're gonna trace through the years. This is the 1962 St. Rose basketball team. And there's some notable people in here. First off is Pat McCann, who was a, a coach for, well, decades at the Jersey Shore at St. Rose. Still lives across the street from the school, right there in Belmar. In fact, he, he invited me over to his house this summer and uh, he and, and Vinnie Cox and uh, Steve Gepp and uh, Jerry Matthews all came over and were just trading stories. And uh, it, was, it was a really nice day. And uh, so anyway, but the person I'm noting here is right in the, in the middle, a junior, and his name is Bob Verga. 
And most people would say he was the greatest basketball player ever from the Jersey Shore. St. Rose went on to win a state championship this year, his junior year, and they won again in 1963, his senior year. He averaged over 40 points a game that year, scored over 1,000 points in that one season, um, and hit the game when he shot at the buzzer in the championship game against Phillipsburg Catholic. Uh, so he, uh, he was a legend in this area. He went on to play at Duke. And there he is playing at Duke, and he was an All-American at Duke. And his last two years at Duke, he averaged 27 points a game. In 1966, actually, uh, Duke went to the Final Four, and they were considered the favorite to win the national championship. And Berger came down with bronchitis, and he was very sick uh, at the tournament. But he played anyway, but he wasn't, he wasn't up to par and they end up losing to Kentucky in the semifinals. Well, Kentucky went on to the finals that year, and it was a famous final because Kentucky had not been integrated in the basketball team yet, and they played Texas Western, which was an all-black starting lineup, and they made a movie about it a few years ago called Glory Road, and that was that final four, the 1966 final four, and Texas Western ended up beating them. But had Bob Verga been healthy, there may not have been a Texas Western story. Because they were that good. But it didn't work out. So it's interesting. Bob Berger went on to play the ABA, played the NBA. But he always came back to the Jersey Shore to play in the Jersey Shore League. And it was, he was incredibly popular. This is actually Bergen Convention Hall playing for the Shore All Stars against uh, another team. This is 1973. Um, and again, he was he was almost he was wildly popular. He drew huge crowds. My dad used to take us to see him down when, when they played along the beach at Jerry Lynch's hotel, and uh, he always played. Go ahead again. So then I found this photo, and this is Bob Berger's last game he ever played. So he's done playing professionally, and this is the championship game of the nineteen. 76 Jersey Shore League. You can see it's packed. This is at the headliner. They had moved to the headliner. That's Virga driving with the ball. He never played after this. And it's a kind of a notable picture for a number of reasons. Obviously, there's Virga right here trailing the play. That's Phil Sellers, who earlier that year had led Rutgers to the Final Four, unbeaten. And then they finally lost in the national semifinal game. So he's on the court. This is Elnardo Webster, who was a star from Jersey City. Played at St. Peter's, was drafted by the Knicks, played a little bit in the NBA, but, but uh, played all over the world. And uh, so he, he's in this photo. This is a guy named Earl Foreman, who uh, he played everywhere, but was just one of those nonstop uh, basketball junkies who showed up everywhere, all kinds of leagues. But again, you go you go back to Bob Verga at St. Rose, this young kid, and you can take his career right through his final game in the Jersey Shore League in 1976. And that's what photos can kind of do, is take you through this progression of a player, of a person. Right there. Yeah. Another great photo. I love this photo. This is from 1967. And this is the Lakewood High School basketball team after they had won the state championship in Atlantic City. They'd gotten back home and they took this photo. And again, the trophy, the little kids, you know, the, the, everybody is happy. It, it's a great photo. This is Bob Nastis. He was the coach at the time, was there for a while. This was his star player, John Richardson. And John went on to play at Temple. And go ahead, Jar. And then we come to this photo. And this is the 1975 Lakewood team. Got a little cut off here. But there's Nassus, and there's John Richardson. But actually, this photo got cut off. But right here is Mike Rogers, who went on to coach. That ocean. <laughs> so this is the 1975 Lakewood team. 
Now, <clears throat> they were a great team. And they went on to play in what many think is the, is the greatest basketball game ever at the Shore. And that was the Group 3 1975 final against East Orange at Brookdale. East Orange had won three straight state championships. They were unbeaten. They were considered the best team in the country. It was a big deal. I mean, the place was packed. You know, this was, we have a whole series of photos from that, and this was one from the stands. You see the local chamber had given out these little uh, banners to fans, and they, they were all holding them up. So this is the Lakewood bench during the game. Here's Nastis. That's Calvin Troy, more about him later. This is Kevin King right here, who went on to play at uh, UNC Charlotte. And two years later, he was in the Final Four with UNC Charlotte. They were the original Cinderella's uh, of the NCAA tournament when the tournament was just getting big. So this turned out to be an incredible game. And I came right down to the very end. And Kelvin Troy, we have amazing pictures of the whole scene. I only have one photo of the actual game, and this is it. And this is Kelvin Troy making two free throws with one second left on the clock to beat East Orange by a point. Um, good, yeah. It was, it really was, we have many photos like this. So these are the Lakewood kids after the game on the car. And again, you just see the whole, the whole scene. We peeled the orange. And, uh, and, uh, so just, again, how photos can kind of take you through a whole sequence of stuff and, and, and kind of transport you back. All right, Gab. This is a photo now I came across, and we're, we're going to go through so, a, a couple of different things now that um, kind of shows you that there are some backstories behind different photos. I came upon this, and honestly, I could not stop thinking about this photo. You know, who are these guys? What, what actually happened here? This is from, um, it's a January night in the Neptune gym, 19. 63. And a guy by the name of Frank Beardsley took that photo. When I actually first started at the press in the mid 80s, he was still there. And uh, he was a great photographer. And all it said on the back was third quarter fight. And he did list, because he was a pro, the main people in here and everyone they were. But I took it upon myself, I want to know everything about this night and these people and what happened that, in that game. So just a couple of quick things. The referee here, who has got his arms around a guy by the name of Jim Bell, who as you can see, he is a big guy, 6'5". That's Joe Pelea. <laughs> and he has clearly jumped right in and is trying to break this thing up. This guy's name is Jim Grassdorf. He played for Manasquan. This is Manasquan against Neptune. And he was no shrinking violet himself. He was a, a two-time all shore defensive end, about 6'3". Um, so I went and interviewed almost everyone in this photo, and it's a it's a pretty interesting story. Gar? This is actually the photo, this is actually the Asbury Park press from the next day. You see that photo is in there, and there's a whole sequence of photos. That was a big game. First off, Neptune did not lose a home basketball game from 1959 to 1968. They went nine years without losing a game at home. They trailed late in this game. Bob Davis, who went on to be a quarterback in Virginia with the Jets and uh, several other teams, actually hit two free throws late in the game for the Neptune comeback. But, the, but Manasquan was winning a lot of that game. So I went back and talked to a lot of the people there. And one thing they say is no punches were actually thrown in that. As bad as that looks, no punches were ever thrown. Although it was apparently a very contentious game back and forth throughout. 
In fact, uh, one of the guys, go ahead, Gary. I'll go back to this. This guy, his name is uh, Gary Carroll. He's still in the area. He's a big guy, too. He founded a, uh, a company called Aqualand Pools. You see their stuff all over the place. He was actually a football defensive end and had played against Grassdorf and, and said Grassdorf was incredibly tough. <clears throat> These teams actually, Neptune came back to win this game. Manasquan ended up beating them later in the year at Manasquan and they had to have a playoff at Convention Hall to decide the division title and then those teams would play for a, for a short conference championship and Neptune ended up winning that, that rematch uh, at Convention Hall. But anyway, Jim Bell went on to play basketball at Florida A&M. Jim Grasdorf actually went to Memphis State and was really bound to play in the NFL and ended up hurting his knee in a game against Ole Miss and that kind of ended his career. So I wrote this story just about all of this and uh, I met Monmouth University one day uh, for a it was some kind of a function. And a guy I know came up to me and he said, hey, I read your story. And he said, and Jim Grassdorf had told me when I interviewed him that guys were afraid of him. I remember him saying that. So the guy I knew came up to me after the story ran and he said, hey, I knew that guy. I, I saw him at a party. That guy was a real bully. Like, he was a mean guy. I saw him beat a guy up at a party. Um, so I, you know, I kind of kept that in my head. And then he said, he told me bits and pieces of another story about a fight. Um, a, he didn't have it all right, but he had enough of it right for me to figure, to get the rest of the story. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, try the next one. So this is from 1965. And this is the story here. Friends bid farewell to slain youth. And that guy, this was his younger brother, Bill Grassdorf, who was a year younger and had come home from college. And um, him and his, his buddies, because you could drink in New York at that time, had gone up to Staten Island to a bar. And they had gone in a fight at that bar, a brawl in the parking lot. And they got out of there, and they made it back home to Manasquan, and he went to sleep and woke up, and he was in a coma the next morning. And he died about a week later. But it became a big thing. I mean, it was a big trial. It was in our paper for about three years. Um, and um, so I often think about that, because Jim Grassdorf, his brother, went on to become an educator. He was a high school and college football coach for 30 years. He retired um, as a high school principal and in talking to people had clearly you know devoted his life to you know education and, and changing kids lives. So I always wonder and think back if this incident maybe had I don't know, changed him in some way because it seemed like back then you know, he was just like his brother. They were tough kids. You know, they were, and, you know, he ended up really making a difference in a lot of kids' lives. So, um, again, just kind of a backstory on that story from one photo I found and, and just wanted to know a little bit more about. Okay? That is actually Jim Myr well, Jim Bell is what he was called in high school, but his name was actually Jim Myrick. And that's him looking at that photo years later. Uh, and he and Jim Grassdorf actually got together about two years ago and uh, talked about old times. So it was kind of cool to see them get together. All right, yeah. We, we went to do a story on the greatest athletes ever at the Jersey Shore. And to kind of get the ball rolling on that, I 
just put a little solicitation in the paper asking readers what their thoughts were. You know, let me know. Who do you think were the greatest athletes ever? And I got a lot of feedback, a lot on social media. Everyone kind of had their own favorite athletes. And I got a simple email, and all it said was, go back to 1937, Lakewood High School, Pernell Mincy. That's all it said. And it turned out it was from a woman whose name was Pearl Kramer. And she was 95 years old, and she referred to herself as the last of the Mohicans, the last of the Lakewood class of 1937. And I happened to find this photo. It's the only one I could find. And that is Pernell Mincy right there. And for a couple, a number of things about this photo. First off, it's clearly an integrated team. Yeah, and Pernell Mincy was all state in three sports: football, basketball, and baseball. And he was a great athlete. His his his, his parents were sharecroppers in Georgia and moved to Lakewood in the 1920s. And he was an amazing athlete. Lakewood was unbeaten his last two years in football. Uh, he caught the winning touchdown against Tom's River on Thanksgiving Day in 1936. Um, good, yeah. That's him, that's a, an old clip of him from a paper in New York uh, showing the top high school player from New Jersey, and that's him in 1935. Um, just a great athlete. Go ahead, Jack. When he was pitching in 1937, 1936, so his junior year, Joe Lewis was training for Max Schmeling, the big fight in Lakewood. And before one of the games, Joe Lewis came to a Lakewood High School baseball game and threw out the first pitch and stayed for the game. This is Joe Lewis in Lakewood in 1936. And then Pernell Mincy took the mound and struck out 12. And he went through that whole year unbeaten. He really was an amazing pitcher. And that ended up being where he made his mark. Go ahead, Gary, I think I've got it. He actually went on to pitch in the Negro Leagues. And eventually made his way to the Newark Eagles where he played against uh, alongside players like Monty Irvin, who went on to play with the Giants, he went on to play with the Cubs. Um, and his career, Pernell Mincy's career ended in 1941. He actually snapped a tendon in his pitching arm. So about six years before Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier. It would have been really, and he was pretty young at that time, he was in his early 20s, so his career kind of ended there. So anyway, we run this story, and it was, you know, it was a very popular story. And the next day I get a call from a guy who actually was living right out in Ocean Township here. And he says, you know, not for nothing, but my name's Sam Warren, and I'm also from the Lakewood class in 1936, 37. And by the way, I was Pernomancy's catcher. <laughs> And he proceeds to tell me these stories about him describing this Nolan Ryan-like figure was how hard this guy threw. Uh, he was, he just told some great stories about him and what he was able to accomplish and how good he really was. And he told actually some other great stories, one of which, go ahead, Gar, was after one of their games that year, the Hindenburg, comes over, over Lakewood, on its way to Lakehurst. So that was May of 1937. This is actually the Hindenburg from Copeland Avenue in Asbury Park. So on its way south. Um, so again, a, a, an example of just getting a little nugget of information and kind of developing that into something a little bit more. And in this case, a couple of instances where it really kind of intersects with history. And, you know, the, this sports kind of intersecting, intersecting with real, real life. All right, Dan. This is a 
another team. We, we were working on something on the greatest football teams ever at the Shore, and someone had told me about the 1953 Freehold team, and that's, that's them right there. Another, again, a great team photo. And the 1953 team was clearly one of the greatest teams ever. They went 9 now. Go ahead, Darren. And this guy right here, that's Jackie Mays. And he was the first black quarterback at the Jersey Shore. He was a great athlete. They both ways. And it really, it, it, was, a, it was very much of a groundbreaking team. Go ahead, Ken. This is Harold Hal Shank. He was the coach of the team. All right, he grew up in Lakewood. He played alongside Pernell Mincy in Lakewood. Went on to quarterback Rutgers, and then ends up landing in Freehold, and really built uh, some great teams. He had the first, that year, 1953, was an all-black backfield, unheard of. And there was pressure within town to change that. There was pressure from other teams, did not want to play them. He would not relent. They, they were going to do it this way, and this guy was really a pioneer, very much of a groundbreaker in, in, in that area. And they had a great team. Go ahead, Gary. This is a guy whose name is Pollard Stanford. Everybody called him Polly. He was a lineman, an all-state lineman on that team. And they had a situation in downtown Freehold, they had a, a coffee shop on South Street where players would go and they would get donuts before the games or after the games. And everyone could go in and buy it, but only the white players could sit at the counter. The black players had to go outside to eat. And so the team got together and they started having protests outside. They would just stand there outside. and. It was amazing because then some of the townspeople would get involved, and this kind of went on. And as Polly Stanford described it to me years later, he said, they never actually changed the policy at the coffee shop. They just took out the seats so no one could sit. <laughs> but it's amazing. Now, Polly Stanford went on to play football at North Carolina A&T in Greensboro. And Greensboro, in the late 1950s, was kind of one of the epicenters of the civil rights movement. There were sit-ins, and he became, ended up becoming very involved in civil rights down in the South. And it all, again, it all started from being involved with this 1953 Freehold team, a groundbreaking coach, and you know, and seeing things that, he, that they didn't like and doing something about it right here in Freehold. So again, just kind of looking for something about, about a team, you come up with all these stories that, that kind of resonate beyond athletics. Go ahead, Karen. This is a photo, and I'm going to just leave you with a couple of a couple of photos here. And this is I don't know much about this, but all it said was 1903 Asbury Park football. <laughs> it's a pretty amazing photo, really. It's kind of this ragtag collection of guys. I assume this might be where the stadium is today. I don't know. Um, but again, I just recently came across this, and this is one of those photos where you look at it and I'm like, I, I, I'm going to definitely dig in and try and find out more about this. And what, what be, who these people are. And, and I, I honestly have actually gone back and I can't even find anything about football in Asbury Park that early. So I don't know if this was like in just an early collection of, of kids trying to play. But uh, it's very interesting to me. Right, yeah. And I'm going to leave you with one more photo. This is a great one. That is the St. Rose basketball team 
You see right here, 1925-26. It's on the steps of the school, those steps are still there. And the priest was probably their coach. And, you know, everybody's got the knee pads on. It's an integrated team. It's a black player. And, again, another photo where... I may even put this in the paper and just ask people, do you, does anyone know who these people are? Because I'm curious now, whatever became of all these kids? Uh, when you look at something like that, it just kind of piques your interest. So hopefully, next time we talk, I'll have more information on that. But I'm going to leave you with that. And again, I, I hope I've, I've kind of shown you some pretty nice photos and kind of piqued your interest on the history of old photos and, and the history of sh sports at the shore and kind of how it all intersects with life. So thanks. Thanks for listening.